What is up, my exchange family from all over the world? And thank you for tuning in to another episode of Chief Chat. My name is Chief Master Sergeant Kevin Osby, and I'm your senior enlisted advisor for the Army and Air Force Exchange Service. Before we get started with our guest today, I would like to introduce my lovely co-hosts, Leah Matthews and Julie Mitchell. How y'all doing? Hey, it's great to see you again. It's been um, it's been a little over a week, so good to be yeah. back. Yeah, we got a hey little guys. break. Hey, how you doing, Leah? Good, Chief. How are you? Leah's fresh off the Army Navy game, so <laughs> so, so we're glad to have you back. And so, yes, sir. This is our last episode for 2020, you guys. How y'all feel about that? It, it we've so this is our 85th episode. If you had told me a year ago that we would be doing Facebook live broadcasts, 85 of them, I would have said you're crazy. So um, yeah, it's a little bittersweet. I know, I know. So. We're gonna have our season finale. We're gonna call this the season finale, uh, and, and we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna end the year out with a bang because we have a very special guest, a very special guest that's related to a former president and an American military legend. Uh, Julie, please introduce today's guest. Absolutely, Chief. You're right. We have an outstanding guest with us today. She's an expert on strategic leadership, and she has spent decades in Washington as a strategist focusing on national security. She is the granddaughter of President Dwight D. Eisenhower, who served as the 34th president of our nation. She's here to discuss her latest book, How Ike Led, the principles behind Eisenhower's biggest decisions. Please give a warm chief chat welcome to Susan Eisenhower. Hey. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Awesome. Susan, thanks so much for taking time out to join us. Uh, we really appreciate it. We know uh, soldiers and airmen will too. So just a real quick housekeeping. Everybody watching, drop a note in the comments and let us know where you're tuning in from. You can leave your questions and comments for Susan. We'll be reading those live throughout the broadcast. Now's a great time to start your watch party to enjoy this live interview with your friends. And if you're not following our page, well, you should because Chief Chats are every week and we have 2021 scheduled uh, through February already. Awesome, awesome. So Susan, it is such a pleasure to meet you and have you on the show today. Uh, we're super excited to have you join us and learn more about your latest book, How Ike Led. So uh, can you tell us where you're joining us from today? Well, I'm uh, outside of Portland, Maine, and uh, we're uh, expecting between uh, six and 15 inches. I think we're up around six at the moment, so we've still got several hours to go. Oh my goodness! So wow! Get those <laughs> get those snow shovels ready. <laughs> That's right. Well, I want you to know I've thought of everything, and I'm fully um, fully ready to uh, uh, organize things should I lose power. Okay. Gotcha. I've, I've, I've got all the backup systems already in place. She, she's got a generator just for cheap chat. That's what I'm talking about. Thank you. Well, she has a flash. She said she had a flashlight. She had something for her Wi-Fi. The most prepared guest we've ever had on cheap chat, Miss <laughs> Susan Eisenhower. <laughs> oh, that's great. Susan, so how have you been doing during the pandemic and what's it been like releasing your book during this crisis and how have you been able to engage with your readers during this time? Well, it's been very interesting. This is my fifth book, and, and in book tours uh, in previous years, back in the day, we might say, you'd get on an airplane, <laughs> you would get off, you'd uh, give an hour talk, you'd get back on an airplane, and you'd go home, and that would be a day or a day and a half uh, exercise, and now you can do it in an hour, uh, and that means that uh, the intensity of it can be uh, much greater. And uh, it's certainly got some advantages because you can be places where you'd never be able to go simply for uh, the amount of time it would take. So I've enjoyed uh, Zooming all over the country and talking to people about this book. Excellent. And you grew up during your grandfather's presidency. What were the eight years of Ike's presidency like for you? Well, first of all, I think it's worth saying that uh, we come from a big army family. Uh, my grandfather, of course, was the Supreme Allied Commander of Forces in, in Europe that uh, brought about the unconditional surrender of uh, Nazi Germany. And the, the, the feeling of um, that military discipline and everything else pervaded our family, uh, absolutely. I must say that I think, uh, uh, I think my father once said that he was born standing at attention. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> some idea. But um, you know, I, th I thought for a very long time I had a completely normal childhood, except for the Secret Service protection. 
Uh, and uh, it, my parents worked very, very hard uh, to make that happen. As a matter of fact, my father said, I'm gonna make sure you never start wearing the boss's stars. Uh, but yesterday, <laughs> yesterday somebody uh, sent me somebody's Facebook posting of me as a little kid um, helping the National Epilepsy League um, uh, raise money by selling advent calendars. And I thought, well, you know, for a three-year-old, I'm sitting there with my two siblings, that, that's not terribly normal for a three-year-old. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, later during his presidency, as I wrote in the book, uh, when Eisenhower could not find a resolution with the Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev over the Berlin ultimatum, uh, he decided to soften up the Soviet Premier by exposing him to his exceedingly well-behaved um, four grandchildren. <laughs> you know, a little <laughs> bit, a little bit uh, role in the, uh, you know, the dangers of the Cold War, and um, and so that's not terribly normal either. But I, I really have to give uh, my parents and my grandparents a lot of credit for making sure that we never carried this around with us like it was our achievement, because we have a very clear idea in our family uh, that this was uh, granddad's um, responsibilities, which he uh, executed um, with, I, I think, success. And um, that was him and we are we. So that's how it goes. <laughs> yeah, and, and I, do, I also want to add that he was also a five-star general. So th there's not many, there was only a handful of five-star generals uh, uh, ever in American history, and, and he was definitely one of them. So, uh, and they, they're only, they're, uh, there's only five star generals in times of war. Um, and so that, like I said, that was just a, a unique nugget that I, that I picked up while I was doing a little bit more research. Well, Chief, if I could add to that, uh, there are really only three uh, people uh, in our history who have fought a major war, um, and that would be uh, the War of Independence, George um, Washington, Ulysses S. Grant, and Dwight Eisenhower, who also went on to have two-term presidency. Um, so this is actually a fairly small group of people. Uh, I, I think one of the most important things I did in this book was to demonstrate that Ike the general and Ike the president was the same person because he used a lot of the same um, methodology that he used during the war in tackling even uh, domestic uh, political fights. Yeah, and so and, and so you you knew uh, Ike as your grandfather, and so I I can imagine the dynamics uh, of of mm -hmm. you you growing up in the household, and you were seventeen when he passed away, but uh, mm -hmm. you you know him as your grandfather, which you know gr I get I think I think having a grandmother and grandfather that's like the best job in the world. Like you can give the kids candy and. And then you can give them back to their parents. Like you don't own any <laughs> stock. In, well, you got you got a little stock, but not as much stock as you you, you uh, as the parents, obviously. But um, but when when did you really like understand that he was a big public figure and a world leader? And and how did you how did that shape your view of him once you understood that? Well, for, there are a couple of things here. First, I had Secret Service protection from the time I was a year and a half. Oh, okay. Until the end of his presidency. <laughs> so as I say, that's not terribly normal, but I think it was, it slowly dawned on me the magnitude of his job. We spent a lot of time as kids at the White House. And uh, I, one of my first political memories, I mean, really political memories was his uh, swearing in in 1956. Uh, and I remembered it so well because it was uh, the 20th of January actually occurred on a Sunday uh, and the inauguration day was the next day, but we couldn't have 24 hours without a president of the United States. Uh, and so there were two ceremonies. I attended the one on Sunday, uh, but not the one on Monday just because um, I was still a little kid and it was extremely cold and all of those other factors. Uh, but, you know, it, it began to really occur to me. And then we spent a lot of time with him, even during some of the great moments of, of the second term, uh, which would be uh, the integration of Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas, and the launching of Sputnik, and, and then all of the other, um, you know, dramas that we went through around um, Sputnik and military technology related issues. Um, so you know, I, I knew him as granddad. And I must say that I really respect the fact that he was able to keep his own counsel, come to dinner in the evening, and then the big debate would always be, um, uh, you get to choose a movie tonight, and if you chose a, a romance, Ike wouldn't stay for it. Uh, he, liked, 
<laughs> no, no rom coms. For no rom coms. <laughs> no. No, as a matter of fact, we used to have a big, uh, big laugh in the family that if anybody got kissed in the first ten minutes, he was up and out. You know, <laughs> <laughs> he, he had affairs of state to be worrying about, not the other kind, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but you know, my parents did, I think, a really excellent job, and it helped a lot over time to help us compartmentalize our relationship with granddad from his public career. And that helped a lot because it took uh, probably about 20 years for the scholarly community to catch up with Ike's leadership style. And we used to, in high school, be subjected to long lectures about how Eisenhower. The president really didn't do that much. Oh my gosh, when you read the list of accomplishments and the fact that he did, he got 80% of his legislative agenda through a Congress uh, that for six years was controlled by the Democrats. I mean, um, I'd say that that's a, a significant accomplishment. Everything from the interstate highway system to Hawaii and Alaska and Antarctica and um, <clears throat> creating a uh, the whole satellite industry for the United States and the whole nuclear power industry for the United States. And well, anyway, uh, but they didn't understand his leadership style until the archives were open. So Susan, in How Ike Led, which is available at your local exchange, it's also online at shopmyexchange.com. You give us a fantastic glimpse into the president's leadership style. I have to tell you the one thing that really jumped out at me is how important optimism is to being a leader. Several times in the book, you stress that he could have gone he could have you know, been a naysayer or been pessimistic, but he didn't. It was so important for him to be optimistic. What... Um, and also you point out in the book, he was a strategic leader versus an operational leader. So in your view, what are the components of a good leader? Yes, well, right. I, I mean, it's a, a very important thing you say about uh, optimism because there are two types of optimism. There's the um, optimism that is unattached to reality uh, where um, you know somebody is not uh, really thinking things through, but just saying, uh, you know, um, optimistic platitudes. There's another kind of optimism, which is deeper and more profound. And that is what can be found in great leaders. That is looking at any situation and being able to find the opportunity. So if you'd give me a moment, I just want to uh, remember our troops who fought in the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, we're going into the anniversary period of, of that uh, iconic fight to uh, really um, end Nazi Germany's uh, last offensive to um, pull out uh, uh, their defeat from the war. And uh, there's this moment when Ike goes into the conference room, all of his subordinate commanders are in that room and everybody is very nervous um, about uh, this German offensive. And Ike comes into the room and he says, there will be no long faces in this room. Do you understand that we now have an opportunity? And I think that's the kind of optimism. There's another optimism too I'd like to just mention, which is he deeply believed in the importance of morale uh, for troops. And he believed that morale had to be an input rather than an output. In other words, he had to have troops who were um, optimistic and ready to do this job uh, in the right frame of mind in order to be successful rather than the other way around. So um, I think that those are two elements of that. And as a strategic leader, then he also had to create this optimism around his uh, uh, commanders, his subordinate commanders, because he was a guy who had to pull all the pieces together. Mm -hmm. uh, he wasn't taking one small, si one even large silo of the war. He had it all under his command, which uh, is exemplified by the D-Day decision and everything that went into that. Wow, interesting. Susan, what was writing this book like for you? I, I assume masses, massive amounts of research was needed. Um, can you walk us through that process? Well, uh, you don't ever want to talk to writers about the process of how they got there. <laughs> You've heard about sausage making, correct? Uh, yes, well, no, ma'am. You know, I, 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 I found it actually thrilling because I allowed myself to do something that I had tried very hard to avoid doing in my life, which was to... Um, deploy what I knew about him in the context of these decisions. In other words, I'd read a lot of uh, scholarly work and uh, occasionally, you know, the, the scholar would almost act as if they didn't understand why Eisenhower did that. And I'd say, oh, I know why, <laughs> you know, because I could remember something that was said at the dinner table. 
um, you know, I constantly said to us, you know, how does this look to the other guy? And he'd make us at the dinner table. This is usually because my brother and I were, you know, hotly debating some issue and every, the adults loved watching it uh, go on. And he'd say, now, how does, that, how does that look to the person you're talking about? Because you think in warfare, you have to do this, right? You have to assess how the enemy sees the situation. You even have to assess how your allies do. So what I did in this book was to bring together what I know about him and try to integrate it into um, a book that is largely drawn uh, from the memories of his um, uh, colleagues during the war, his associates during the White House, and some you know excellent scholarship on this subject. Very emotional experience, by the way. Yeah. What What, what was the most like compelling thing that you you found out uh, that you didn't know about your grandfather? Um, well, first of all, I I continue to be amazed at how much self-discipline he had. Uh, he was known as a kid to have a very fiery temper. He was a very emotional guy, actually, uh, which you can see if you read his diaries. I mean, uh, uh, I think I'm always constantly reminded about, about uh, how he managed to get his inner space uh, organized for some of the toughest decisions that had to be made in the last century. Um, so that was, it wasn't a surprise to see it, but it was a surprise to see so many people recognize it in his administration. Uh, the other thing then is too, is everybody thinks, oh, it's really easy to get everybody to go along with something. Well, no, it's really not. Yeah. And uh, Eisenhower really was very consistent about his goals for um, uh, any mission that he had. And that was to um, bring people together um, because you can't fight a battle uh, with people in a state of great division. And then during his presidency, and I'll stop on this one, uh, he thought that uh, the deep divisions in our country, which existed when he became president, um, he thought that was a national security issue. Uh, and so one of his highest missions was uh, not only to bring peace and prosperity to the United States, but to unite this country in the process, because he said disunity is, quote unquote, a welcome sight to an alert enemy. Um, and I, I really wish that all of our countrymen today would recognize that we really need to start talking to each other in a different way and to bring that kind of sense of community together again. Oh, absolutely. Amen to that one. Uh, <laughs> so so we, we talk, let's talk about your, your own leadership style, because uh, I know your grandfather probably, influ you, you, you've got pieces of your grandfather, I'm sure, in your leadership style. <laughs> so uh, can, you, can you kind of describe your leadership style and, and who else kind of hit, influenced you or mentored you along the way? Well, I've got to say that um, I was very influenced by my grandfather's leadership style, but I have to say that one of the great um, thrills really of my uh, young adulthood was that uh, many of the people who worked closely um, with my grandfather during the war and his presidency took me under their wings um, and showed me the ropes in Washington and General Andrew J. Goodpaster, who I admire so deeply. He was a uh, a four-star general who did many things. Uh, he was a um, sack here. Uh, he also um, took a star off to go back to West Point and straighten up um, the military academy after the cheating scandals. And I mean, he was a great American hero and he was one of Ike's closest associates. And I was uh, lucky to be men menteed. I was his mentee. So the point here is, is that this leadership style comes down you know, a long line. And this is what I'm trying to do with my own students at Gettysburg College is to share uh, what I knew from them. Um, and what I would say is I got, I got a lot of um, what they said. I think that I have some uh, a special orientation towards strategic thinking, but I just want to reiterate that I brought my flashlight today. Yep. And yes, absolutely. Uh, lost power. So that, yeah. that really means that contingency planning, oh my gosh, you have no idea how much contingency planning ruled our household as a kid. <laughs> and and, and we, we saw elements of that because you wanted to make sure that the connection was good. So we had a, a couple of dry runs and all kind of other stuff. There and we had, never, we had never had that from any guests that we've ever had on the show. So Well, you'll think of me as high maintenance after this show. <laughs> no, ma'am. No, uh, ma'am. No, You're no. good. You are a strategic leader. That's what you are. There we go. Well, you know, we wouldn't want to let anybody down who was good enough to tune in today. <laughs> <laughs> so Susan if Ike were here with us today what do you think he would like most about your book well I um there are a couple of things I I think he um 
might feel quite gratified that I captured, I think, I hope on every page, is that when he took that oath to defend the Constitution of the United States when he was a plebe at West Point, he never stopped putting his country first. And when he was uh, in the White House, so few people realized that for his whole life, he wasn't a Democrat or a Republican. He was a man who was serving his country. And that's the, tr that's the way he tried to uh, run his two terms um, in the White House. And then finally, um, I don't know, not much of it is, is, is made of this, but I, uh, one of the things that was so striking to me as a kid is I, I used to walk to his office um, in his retirement um, on the campus of Gettysburg College, and he would give me um, a ride back uh, to my house, which was um, on a, a, a property very close by. And uh, we'd have time to talk and this and that. And I was in the office one day and I noticed a letter on his wall. And it was a letter from um, John F. Kennedy reinstating Dwight Eisenhower's five-star rank and his commission in the army. Uh, so I guess part of what I'd like to tell our uh, group here today is that um, Ike died as General Eisenhower. He didn't die as President Eisenhower. Uh, that was the one thing he said he wanted nothing from the Kennedy administration except that he would like to have uh, his reinstatement in the United States Army. Uh, and he was buried, I know, because I, I saw him in his casket. He was, he was buried in his uniform. Um, and I think there's something very moving about that. Oh, yeah, definitely. Mm, yes, yeah, I mean, moving because that commitment he made when he was 20 was what carried him through all of these difficult decisions and all this time, um, you know, that he was... Um, you know, part of uh, our public policy world. You had brought up in the book that he went to West Point to get an education, but while there, that love of country really, really came through. And you'd also talked about like how he grew up um, in a family that had values and with all the brothers and the, the parents who led the way and, and raised them the right way with values. But that love of country really came through during his time at West Point and then it, it never left. You know, it's interesting about my great grandparents or Ike's parents, they, um, they raised their kids very diligently. It was a deeply religious household. Uh, until um, I guess it'd be 21 back in those days, or uh, yeah, I think it'd be 21. And then you were on your own. Mm. And they didn't question uh, decisions when they felt that you would have reached adulthood. Um, my great grandparents were both pacifists. My great grandmother had survived the Civil War and she wasn't going to have anything to do with any, you know, confrontation or, um, you know, military confrontation or anything else. But when Ike decided to go to West Point, she accepted his decision. Um, and it's that too, I think is moving. It was very brave of him actually to leave a pacifist religious community and go to serve his country at West Point. Then he gets to West Point and he realizes all those things his parents had taught him about um, finding something bigger than yourself that you can commit yourself to, that the country he understood was bigger than himself and it was what he wanted to commit his life to. Um, and so the, I think that that was part of why he never um, wavered um, in his knowledge of why he was doing what he was doing. Amazing. Susan, what are you hoping that readers, including future leaders, will take away from the book? If there's, just, if there's one thing that you want them to take away, what would it be? Oh, boy. Well, you know, I've got to say, um, I think I can only sum it up with one sentence that uh, and that would be that Dwight Eisenhower still has so much to say to us. As a matter of fact, I think he's got more to say to us today than he did in the um, immediate aftermath of his, his death, because uh, this country has been through um, some really troubled times. Um, and Ike the Optimist would say, yes, we've got a lot of hard work ahead of us, but we can do this. Um, and I think the book, um, How I Cled, you see, How I Cled, not What I Cled, How I Cled, I think is a way of looking at how he used his leadership skills um, to redirect the direction of the United States and to move it into a pos uh, positive, optimistic way. You know, in his presidency in the 19, uh, between 1957 and 1958, we had a pandemic. Um, and it was the Asian flu, and he made sure that every American got vaccinated, and he managed the economy in such a way that he produced three balanced budgets, got close on another two occasions, 
um, and left um, President John F. Kennedy with a budget surplus left over from the Eisenhower administration. Um, and all of that was for uh, what he would have called post-war recalibration, the modernization of America. We can do this. I know we can do it in, in the coming months and years to recalibrate ourselves and to modernize our country for really another transformational time. Wow. Susan, just want to pause for a moment to turn to the live feed um, and share some viewer feedback. We have people watching from all over the world. Um, Sonia says, hello. She says, Martha. I love being able to get firsthand account from family and others who were a part of these historical events. Robert Ellis says, hello, Susan. And Sonia says, that's something that we need nowadays, which is not to be one political party or another, but just to serve the people. Absolutely. Can, well, can, we, can we all just love each other? That's, that's, mm -hmm. that's the main thing. Well, you know, what we're not doing very well is that we're not really, uh, I can hear granddad saying this, as how does it look to the other guy? I mean, if all of us could put ourselves in the places of our neighbors and our community members uh, and think, would I want to be treated that way? Um, would I want to be forgotten? I think, uh, I think everybody's got a lot more in common with each other in this country than we think. Uh, and it's, I think it's up to all of us to do some work ourselves, you know, to make sure that we're treating our neighbors the right way and our community members the right way so that we can, you know, enlarge upon that. Um, well, thank you. Um, I'm so glad that there's an interest in historic um, events among this group because uh, we forget uh, we're thinking today, for instance, that we're in the most dangerous or the most frightening time ever in American history. And I think this um, book demonstrates actually that there have been some very, very dire times and we got through it and we got through it uh, ultimately together. And I think that's the the optimistic ending. Oh, should have added that Ike would have loved the optimistic ending. <laughs> <laughs> Ma'am, it's definitely, it, it's a book of hope for, for sure. And as a reminder, our shoppers can find how Ike led at your local exchange or shopmyexchange.com. And Susan, where can viewers go to keep up with you? Well, I have a, a website. It's www.susaneisenhower.com. And I uh, do some uh, blogging about once a month, but there's a lot of information there about my book and the reviews and everything. Um, and then I um, would love to hear from people about what they'd like to hear more about. So uh, I think also if you um, uh, write me there, I'll send along a book plate. How's that for um, yeah. people who would like to have their books personalized? Um, and then uh, I'm uh, on Twitter at Eisenhower Group. Uh, somebody else claimed my name, so what are you gonna do? Right? Oh wow! <laughs> oh. Shady. That is really shady. I'm calling myself the, the real Susan Eisenhower. Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, there yeah. you go. The real there Susan. Go. <laughs> Under, under, with the underscore at the end yeah. or something like that. Yeah, exclamation <laughs> point, right? <laughs> Absolutely. So, uh, before we wrap up, do you have any parting words that you want to share with the military community? Well, I, I can't tell you, I'm, I'm an army brat on all sides. Both of my grandfathers um, were in the army. My uh, maternal grandfather um, fought in the first world war. He was in combat in the second world war and he was in combat in the Korean war. Uh, my grandfather, as you know, um, served uh, troops during the uh, world war one, commanded victorious troops in world war two and ended the Korean war. And my father was uh, in combat, was in, a, in Europe um, after graduating from West Point on D-Day um, in the Second World War and was in a combat unit in Korea um, uh, uh, during his uh, time as a military officer. And both of my, I only have two uncles and they all were um, uh, professional military officers. So uh, I am definitely an army brat and I just wanna say it's been a real privilege, Chief, to be here with you. Thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity to talk to your community. Outstanding. And so it's, it's truly been an honor to have you with us today. Um, I just want to thank you and, and your family uh, for, for blazing the trail for, for people like me to, to wear this uniform proudly and, and represent this great nation. So uh, thank, thank you and uh, many, uh, God bless to, to you and your family.
So well, um, I'd like to, if, Chief, if I could just offer, um, I, I should have said first, and I mean it from the bottom of my heart, you have no idea how much I personally uh, and my whole family appreciates everybody uh, who is working to serve their country. And the military has done a magnificent job for us in our history and uh, where we are right now. And I just want to send my warmest Christmas greetings to all of you. Outstanding, outstanding. Happy holidays to you as well. So uh, just please know that having you with, your, with us means so much to our America's airmen, soldiers, sailors, Marines, Coast Guard members, and our newest uh, newest force, uh, the Space Force. Uh, Space Force. Personnel, absolutely. <laughs> um, and so thank you for being with us today and wish you happy holidays and the best of 2021. Happy holidays. Okay, have a good one. Bye-bye. Bye, guys. Thanks, Susan. Merry Christmas. Thank you. Merry Christmas.